Hey everybody, today is Tuesday, April 7th. Thanks for joining me here today uh, as I review a few things and gets to continued with our read aloud. So, let's get ready. A couple reminders, the same thing as yesterday. Um, make sure you pay attention to those changes that we're focusing on the IXL. Uh, Olaf will tell you that that's important to work on. So, make sure that you guys are uh, taking a look at those IXL standards, the math ones and the reading ones. If you have any questions on those at all, please let me know. I'll be happy to answer those questions. Um, but message me if there's something you want me to review. I'd be happy to do it. Um, head up to get some free lunch and breakfast up at the high school. Uh, yesterday was burgers. It was good. Uh, I know Cal and Emery enjoyed it. So hopefully you guys are stopping up there and getting those free lunches and breakfast up at the high school between 11 and 1 each day. Uh, message me or call me. I love hearing from you guys. You can send me a message on Hangouts, any of those things. I love hearing from you guys. Keep me updated on what's going on. Uh, so I love to hear from you guys. So keep those messages coming in. Stay safe and stay home. Although a reminder, parents, it's election day, so they should get out and vote. So I'm going to add that. Okay, so reminder, parents, today is election day, and they should go vote. They should dress appropriately. But remind your parents to uh, to go vote. So that is an important thing today. Taking a look at academics. Reminder of those standards. I'll talk about them on the next slide. But take a look at those on IXL. They're also posted on Dojo. Still play Prodigy. Get a few minutes of that in. And I did post a Kahoot uh, yesterday. So take a look at that. Reading. Uh, you should be reading 20, 30 minutes every day. Keep doing that. Keep looking at those IXL uh, or sorry, keep uh, reading and, and taking those AR tests and looking at IXL. Social studies, uh, I did post a video last week and I asked you a Socrative question. You can still answer that Socrative question, even for those from last week. So post an answer to that uh, and then take a look at the coot. I posted one about state symbols so you can see how well you remember our state symbols. Mr. Buckley posted something yesterday. See his link in FIAD uh, for things to work on. Stay active. I think it's going to be kind of a crummy day today. But you gotta still try to be active and do something inside if you have to. Okay. These are those standards I was talking about. So when you go into IXL fourth grade, you're looking at D, which is uh, 1 and 7, multiplication facts to 10, which a lot of you know really well. And then you're uh, identifying factors. Um, again, you know, the factors of three are one and three, not multiples. Those are different. Adding and subtracting with like denominators. There's some word problems there, but it isn't too bad. Geometric measurement. So you've got a perimeter and you've got an area one. So make sure you take a look at those. A reminder, perimeter is equal to, you just add up all the sides. So length plus length plus width plus width. Area is going to be length times width. So make sure you take a look at those. But as long as you know those equations, it shouldn't be too bad. City of Ember. We started this this week. I've gotten through a little bit. I started Chapter 2. I didn't finish it. Uh, so we'll learn more about Lena and Dune and what they're up to. Here's that map. I talked about earlier as well. Uh, you can always go back to this, take a look at it. I tried to color code it to make things easier. A reminder, we've got Lena. Her house is right here. It kind of talks about some of these different streets that are going on here. Um, and we'll learn more about the, the mysteries of this town and what's going on. But we are learning that there's pretty much nothing outside of this town that they're aware of. So... We'll continue with that part. The map here. So we've got, here's Lena's house. Let's see if we can find the gathering hall and the clock tower, which is right here. So that's important. And Garn Hall, or Garn Square, I should say, would be right here, not too far from Lena's house. Here's Garn Square. I left off right here, so I kind of was in the middle of this chapter. Um, Poppy was excited, um, and we learned that she lives with her grandmother, taking care of her younger 
sibling and um, that's kind of what we're we learning a lot about her in this chapter so look back if you don't remember but we learned a lot of really important things about granny and her shop and now we're on to the next day the messenger's headquarters was on Cloving Street, not far from the back of the gathering hall. When Lena arrived the next morning, she was greeted by a messenger captain, Alice Fleary, a bony woman with pale eyes and the hair the color of dust. Our new girl, said Captain Fleary to the other messengers, a cluster of nine people who smiled and nodded at Lena. I have your jacket right here, said the captain. She handed Lena a red jacket like the one all messengers wore. It was only a little too large. From the clock tower of the gathering hall came a deep reverberating bong. Eight o'clock, cried Captain Fleary. She waved a long arm. Take your stations. As the clock sounded seven more times, the messengers scattered in all directions. The captain turned to Lena. Your station, she said, is in Garn Square. I'll take a look back here. Lena nodded and started off, but the captain caught her by the collar. I haven't told you the rules, she said. She held up a knobby finger. One, when a customer gives you a message, repeat it back to them to make sure you have it right. Two, always wear your red jacket so people can identify you. Three, go as fast as possible. Your customers pay 20 cents for every message, no matter how far you have to take it. Lena nodded. I always go fast, she said. Four, the captain went on. Deliver a message only to the person it's meant for. No one else. Lena nodded again. She bounced a little on her toes, eager to get going. Captain Fleury smiled. Go, she said, and Lena was off. She felt strong and speedy and sure-footed. She glanced at her reflection as she ran past the window of a furniture repair shop. She liked the look of her long, dark hair flying out behind her, her long legs in the black socks, and her flapping red jacket. Her face, which was never seemed especially remarkable, looked almost beautiful because she looked so happy. As soon as she came to the Garn Square, a voice cried out, Messenger! Her first customer. It was old Natty Prime calling to her from the bench where he was always sat. This goes to Revenant Parsons, 18 Severton Square, he said. Bend down. She bent down so close so, so that her ear was close to his whiskery mouth. The old man said it in a slow, hoarse voice. My stove is broke. Don't come for dinner. Repeat. Lena repeated the message. Good, said Natty Prine. He gave Lena 20 cents, and she ran across the to Severton Square. There, she found Raven and Parsons, also sitting on the bench. She recited the message to him. Old turniphead, he growled. Lazy old flea face. He just doesn't feel like cooking. No reply. Lena ran back to Garn Square, passing a group of believers on the way. They were standing in a circle holding hands, singing one of their cheerful songs. It seemed to Lena that they were more believers than ever these days. What they believed in, she didn't know, but they must make them happy. They were always smiling. Her next customer turned out to be Mrs. Polster, the teacher of the fourth year class. In Miss Polster's class, they memorized passages from the Book of the City of Ember every week. Miss Polster had charts on the wall for everything, with everyone's name listed. If you did, did something right, she made a green dot by your name. If you did something wrong, she made a red dot. What you need to learn, children, she always said in her resonant, precise voice, is the difference between right and wrong in every area of life. And once you learn the difference, here she would usually stop and point to the class, and the class would finish the sentence, You must always choose the right. In every situation, Miss Polster knew what the right choice was. Now, here was Miss Polster again, looming over Lena and pronouncing her message. To Anisset Lafond, 39 Hump Street, as follows, she said. 
My confidence in you had seriously diminished since I heard about the disreputable activities in which you engaged on Thursday last. Please repeat. It took Lena three tries to get this right. Uh-oh, a red dot for me, she said Miss Polster did not seem to find this amusing. Lena had 19 customers that first morning. Some of them had ordinary messages. I can't come on Tuesday. Buy a pound of potatoes on your way home. Please come and fix the front door. Others had messages that made no sense to her at all, like Miss Polster's. But it didn't matter. The wonderful part about being a messenger is not the messages, but the places she got to go. She could go into houses of people she didn't know and hidden alleyways and little rooms and back stores. In the first few hours, she discovered all kinds of strange and interesting things. For instance, Mrs. Sample, the mender, had to sleep on her couch because her entire bedroom, almost up to the ceiling, was crammed with clothes to be mended. Dr. Felina Tower had the skeleton of a person hanging against their living room wall, its bones all held in place with black strings. I study it, she said when she saw Lena staring. I have to know how people are put together. At a house on Kalu Street, Lena delivered a message to a worried-looking man whose living room was completely dark. I'm saving on light bulbs, the man said. And when Lena took the message to the Can Cafe, she learned that certain days in the back room was, a cert was used as a meeting place for people who like to converse about great subjects. Do you think an invisible being is watching over us all the time? She heard someone ask. Perhaps, answered someone else. There was a long silence, and then again, perhaps not. All of it was interesting, and she loved finding things out, and she loved running. And even by the end of the day, she wasn't tired. Running made her feel strong and big-hearted. It made her love the places she ran through and the people whose messages she delivered. She wished she could bring all of them good news that they desperately wanted to hear. Late in the afternoon, a young man came up to her, walking a sort of sideways lurch. He was an odd-looking person. He had a very long neck with a bump in the middle and teeth that were so big they looked as if they were trying to escape from his mouth. His black, bushy hair stuck out from his head in untidy tufts. I have a message for the mayor at the gathering hall, he said. He paused to let the importance of this be understood. The mayor, he said. Did you get that? I got it, said Lena. All right, listen carefully. Tell him. Delivery at eight. From Looper. Repeat it back. Delivery at 8 from Looper. Lena repeated. It was an easy message. All right. No answer required. He handed her 20 cents and she sprinted away. The gathering hall occupied one entire side of Harkham Square, which was the city's central plaza. The square was paved with stone. It had a few benched bo benches bolted to the ground here and there, as well as a couple of kiosks for notices. Wide steps led up to the gathering hall, and a fat columns framed its big door. The mayor's office was in the gathering hall. So were the offices of the clerks who kept track of which buildings had broken windows, what street lamps needed repair, and what number of people in, and the number of people in the city. There was an office of the timekeeper, who was in charge of the town clock, and there was an office of the guards who enforced the laws of Ember now and then putting pickpockets or people who got into fights into the prison room, a small one-story structure with a sloping roof that jutted out from one side of the building. Lena ran up the steps and through the door and into the broad hallway. On her left was a desk, and at the desk sat a guard. Barton Snood, assistant guard, said the badge on his chest. He was a big man with wide shoulders and brawny arms and a thick neck but his head looked as if it didn't belong on his body. It was small and round, and it topped with a fuzz of extremely short hair. His lower jaw jutted out and moved a little on the set from side to side as if he were chewing on something. When he saw Lena, his jaw stopped moving for a moment, and his lips curled upward in a very small smile. Good day, he said. What business brings you here today? I have a message for the mayor. Very good, very good, Barton snoodin' heaved himself to his feet. Step this way. 
He led Lena down the corridor, opened a door marked reception room. Wait here, please, he said. The mayor is in his office, in his basement office, on private business, but he'll be up shortly. Lena went inside. I'll notify the mayor, said Barton Snood. Please have a seat. The mayor will be right with you, or pretty soon. He left, closing the door behind him. A second later, the door opened again, and the guard's small, fuzzy head reappeared. What is the message, he asked. I have to give it to the mayor in person, said Lena. Of course, of course, said the guard. The door closed again. He doesn't seem he doesn't seem very sure about things, Lena thought. Maybe he's new to the job. The reception room was shabby, but Lena could tell that it had once been impressive. The walls were dark red with brownish patches where the paint was peeling away. In the right hand wall was a closed door. An ugly brown carpet lay on the floor, and on it stood a large armchair covered in itchy looking red material and several smaller chairs the small table held its teapot and some cups and a larger table in the middle of the room displayed the copy of the book of the city of ember lying open as if someone was going to read from it portraits of all the mayors of the city since the beginning of time hung on its walls staring solemnly from behind pieces of old glass window old window glass Lena sat in the big armchair and waited. No one came. She got up and wandered around the room. She bent over the book of the city of Ember and read a few sentences. The citizens of Ember may not have luxuries, but the foresight of the builders who filled the, the storerooms at the beginning of time had ensured that they would, would always be, have enough, and enough is all a person need, of wisdom needs. She flipped through a few pages. The gathering hall clock, she read, Measures the hours of the night and day. It must never be allowed to run down. With a, without it, we would, we would. Er, how would we know when to go to work and when to go to school? How would the light director know when to turn out the lights and when to turn them on again? It is the job of the timekeeper to wind the clock every day, every week, and to place the date sign in Harkham Square every day. The timekeeper must perform these duties faithfully. Lena knew that not all timekeepers were as faithful as they should be. She'd heard from one some years ago who often forgot to change the date sign so that it might say Wednesday, week 38, year 227 for several days in a row. There had even been timekeepers who forgot to wind the clock so that it might stand at noon or midnight for hours at a time causing a very long day or a very long night. The result was that no one really knew any more exactly what day of the week it was or exactly how many years it had been since the building of the city. They called this year 241, but it might have been year 245 or 239 or 250, as long as the clock's deep boom rang out every hour and the lights were on and off, went on and off in more or less regularity, it didn't seem to much matter. Lena left the book and examined the pictures of the mayors. The seventh mayor, Pod Mortwat, was a was her great great she didn't know how many greats grandfather. She looked quite he looked quite dreary, Lena thought. His cheeks were long and hollow, his mouth turned down in the corners, and there was a lost look in his eyes. The picture she liked best was the fourth mayor, Jane Larkett, who had been a serene smile and fuzzy black hair. Still no one came. She heard no sounds from the hallway. Maybe they'd forgotten her. Lena went over to the closed door and put her right to the right-hand wall. She pulled it open and saw stairs going down. Maybe while she waited, she'd see what they where they went. She started upward at the top at the top of the first flight was a closed door. Carefully, she opened it. She saw another hallway and more closed doors. She shut the door and kept going. Her footsteps sounded loud on the wood, and she was afraid someone would hear her and come and scold her. No doubt she was not supposed to be here, but no one came, and so she climbed on, passing another closed door. The gathering hall was, only, was the only building in Ember with three stories. 
She had always wanted to stand on its roof and look out at the city. Maybe from there it, it, would, be impos it would be possible to see beyond the city, into the unknown regions. But if the bright city to her, of her drawings really did exist, if the bright city of her drawings really did exist, it would be out there somewhere. At the top of the stairs, she came to a door marked roof. She pushed it. Open, chilly air brushed against her skin. She was outside. Ahead of her was a flat gravel surface, and about ten paces away, she could see a high wall of the clock tower. She went to the edge of the roof. From there, she could see the whole of Ember. Directly below was Harkin Square, where people were moving this way and that, and all of them appearing from the top-down view, more round than tall. Beyond Harkin Square, the lighted windows of the buildings made checkered lines in yellow and black, row after row, in all directions. She tried to see farther across the unknown regions, but she couldn't. At the edge of the city, the lights were so far away that they made a kind of haze. She could not see anything beyond them but the blackness. She heard a loud shout from the square below. Look, came a small, sound-piercing voice. Someone on the roof. She saw a few people stop and look up. Who is that? What is she doing up there? Someone cried. More people gathered until a crowd was standing at the steps of the gathering hall. They see me, Lena thought, and it made her laugh. She waved to the crowd, and they did a few steps from the, from the Bugfoot scurry dance, which she'd learned on the Cloving Square Dance Day, and they laughed and shouted some more. Then the door behind her burst open, and a huge guard with a bushy black beard was suddenly running toward her. Halt! he shouted, through, though she wasn't going anywhere. He grabbed her by the arm. What are you doing here? I was curious, said Lena, in her most innocent voice. I wanted to see the city from the roof. She read the guard's name badge. It was Reg St Stabmark, Chief Guard. Curiosity leads to trouble said Reg Stabmark. He peered down at the crowd. You have caused a commotion. He pulled her towards the door and hustled her down the three flights of stairs. When they came into the waiting room, Barton Snood was standing there looking flustered. His jaw twitched from side to side. Next to him was the mayor. A child causing trouble, Mayor Cole, said the chief guard. The mayor glared at her. I recall your face from assignment day. Shame! disgracing yourself in your new job. I didn't mean to cause trouble, said Lena. I was looking for you so I could deliver a message. Shall we put her in a prison room for a day or two? asked the chief guard. The mayor frowned. He pondered for a moment. What is the message? he said. He bent down so Lena could speak it into his ear. She noticed that he smelled a little like overcooked turnips. Delivery at eight, Lena whispered, from Looper. The mayor smiled a tight little smile and turned to the guard. Just a child's antics, he said. We will let it go this time. From now on, he said to Lena, behave yourself. Yes, Mr. Mayor, said Lena. And you, said the mayor, turning to the assistant guard and shaking his thick finger at him. Watch visitors much more carefully. Barton Snood blinked and nodded. Lena ran up for the door outside the small crowd was still standing by the steps a few of them cheered as lena came out others frowned and muttered words like mischief and silliness and show off lena felt embarrassed and suddenly she hadn't meant to show off she hurried past out to otterwall street and started to run she didn't see dune who was among those watching her he had been on his way home from his first day in the pipeworks when he'd came a, come across the cluster of people gazing up on the roof at the gathering hall and laughing he was tired and chilly the bottoms of his pants and legs were wet and mud clung to his shoes and smeared his hands when he raised his eyes and saw the small fi small figure next to the clock tower he realized right away that it was lena he saw her raise her arm and wave and hop about and for a second he wondered what it would like be what it would be like to be up there looking out over the whole city laughing and waving when lena came down she wanted he wanted to speak to her 
but he knew that he was filthy looking and she would ask him questions. He didn't want to answer, so he turned away, walking fast. He headed for home. Chapter 3 will be Under Ember, and we'll start this tomorrow. I hope you guys are liking the story. It's mysterious and different. Uh, so I hope you guys are really liking it and enjoying it. So tune in tomorrow for a new animal friend and a the chapter two in our story, or the next chapter in our story, I should say. And we'll go from there. If you have any questions at all, please let me know. I love hearing from you guys. I hope you guys are having a great week, and I'll talk to you later. Bye.